This is the Paul Goff Audio Experience, business lessons for physical therapists. My name is Paul Goff, former professional soccer physical therapist turned successful business owner and best-selling author from the UK. Each week, we answer your questions and bring you an inspiring story or person from the global physical therapy community. This show is dedicated to sharing with you everything you need to know to become hugely successful in private practice. Thanks for joining me today. Now let the class begin. Episode of the podcast today, we have um, we have an incredible guest. I'm going to bring in in just a moment. Um, we're in England uh, today, and uh, wherever you are listening to this in the world, we're in a small. Oh, we're heading to a um, a small little town called Bolton, which is um, it's actually very famous in very famous in England for uh, for a few reasons. So I'm going to bring in Nash in just a moment. Um, but first, for everybody listening, uh, welcome. What day is it today? I lose track of the days, and I have to lose track of what country I'm in. Um, it is August. August the 9th it's August the 9th it is a Tuesday and where have I been I've just come back from Spain I've been to Mallorca for a week with my sister and then I flew on to a beautiful little island uh or sorry beautiful area of Spain called uh Marbella, which was um which was pretty cool so I've had two weeks of rest I'm back in the office in England for a week and then I'm off to the United States back to Orlando on Sunday for a full steam ahead uh, 100% focused on the big event that we've got coming up in the next, um, I think it's eight or nine weeks. It's going to come around really, really quickly. Um, the PPM Live uh, Super Conference is happening. Um, I'm just going to put us on so people can answer questions as well in the chat. We're all over the world as usual on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, but yeah, PPM Live, it's uh, it's coming fast. Tickets are selling like crazy. I think we're already 80% capacity. Uh, we've got a few days left for the Financial Skills Day on the Thursday, a few seats for that. Um, and maybe 15 or 16 VIP seats left as well. So we'll uh, we'll be at 300 capacity in the room for um, Damon John flying in from uh, Los Angeles and uh, James uh, James Lawrence, who I believe flies in from Utah. He's uh, he's over in Utah. So very excited for that. Head over to ppmlive22.com to book your tickets. Whenever you're listening to this, this is the best time to grab your tickets. Um, the lowest price. Um, is right now. So head over to ppmlive22.com and we'll see you in Orlando. If there's any reason to come, I could sell you on Damon John, I could sell you on James Lawrence, and I could even sell you on my spiel, right? That I you know, can teach you stuff that will change your life and change your business. And even if you think that you've heard enough from me and you've got what you need from a podcast or from the books or just anything else that you've done, what I want you to always remember as you listen and consider coming to the next big event is this. The best thing I can do for anybody is to bring you into personal contact with other amazing practice owners that are going through the exact same thing as you. There will be 300 um, aspiring PTs there in the room in Orlando across the weekend of the 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th. And um, it is undoubtedly the best reason to attend any conference or seminar like this it is to be in the mix of very successful very growth orientated aspiring uh, practice owners like yourself um so if you are on the fence you are thinking about shalashana i've heard of paul before or i've been to a conference like this or i've read his books or i've listened to 600 episodes of his podcast and he's surely got nothing more to teach me you might be right you might be right i, I i'm not going to agree but you might be right but don't discount the impact of getting to know and be around 300 of the world-class uh, PTs, of which um, one of them uh, will be Nash um, Danga, all the way from Bolton. Nash, let's bring you in. Let's um, let's get this interview on the uh, on the on the road. Nash, how are you? What's going on? Oh, I'm very excited, Paul. Thank you for inviting me. I don't it's, take um... this lightly. I'm grateful to uh, to share my story. Yeah, you've got a fantastic story, and obviously, I've got to watch you now over the years. Um, yeah. I'll bring you in, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about your story. But my uh, first experience of you, I remember when you came up to Hartlepool for our uh, Christmas uh, mastermind. Yeah. Was it just before COVID? Was it the year before COVID? Yeah, the year. Before I think COVID. it was the year before COVID. And I remember uh, you came as a guest, and um, we were in a uh, we we're in a, like a restaurant, and it was all Christmas themed, and we were having dinner yeah. on the night and stuff, and we were just chatting. And I said to you look, there's so much potential there for you and what you're capable of doing and achieving. And, you know, hopefully I've just created a little bit of a blueprint for people uh, to follow. And that's all I ever try yeah. to, to, to do really is just set the, you know, set the pace, if you like, the pacemaker yeah. on all of this. People are going to be successful. I always say this. 
every single person listening to this podcast, they're going to be successful with or without somebody like me. It's just a little bit easier if you can get a model or a you know a kind of a blueprint to uh, to follow. And I I think you are the the epitome of everything that we're about. You and I've said this many times. You remind me uh, of me many times when I uh, I look at you, your energy, your enthusiasm, the things that you do, and how you grow in your business, your family, your travel. Um, you're just having a whale of a time. So tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, specifically, sure. you know, where you're from, the type of business, how you got started. Tell us a little yeah. bit of the backstory of how Nash got started. Sure. So um, originally, my parents are from Zim, so we're from Zimbabwe. Yeah. And obviously, growing with that sort of upbringing sometimes, you can have that negativity um, on life where you're brought up in a certain way, poverty mentality, you know, thinking. So that was, that's what I kind of grew up with. And then as time sort of evolved and you're mingling with different sort of people. And as I uh, went into business as an entrepreneur, um, the story started when I was working as a physio, like most yep. people. And you're, we had an Irish girl uh, that we were working with who was a physio. So she kept following you and going, oh, this is Paul Goff that I follow. He's from Ireland and this and that. So it's like, all oh, right, let me have a look. What's he talking about? So I started following you. And then I think you had a book, Accelerator, advertised on that ad. Yeah. And I found it very strange that you were asking for my details to send me a book and yeah. pay for everything. For me, that was a game changer. I was like, oh, I've, never, <laughs> <laughs> I've never had this before. This guy is going to send me a book about him and what he's doing. What for? What's he after? But I thought, I've got nothing to lose. So and that was it. As soon as that book landed, I started reading. I was like, wow, this guy, because I'm from a sporting background. So I used to play football, actually. Um, yep. So I was a semi-pro footballer. Then I got an injury uh, in my hip. So that's how I ended up then going down the physio route. That's on yep. physios where if you can't sort of go down the sport route, you end up rehabbing yourself and getting yeah, injured, right. getting injured yep. and all that. So I was like, right, let me go down this physio route and discover what this is about. So that's when I fell in love with the physio side of things, and that's how I got into physio. So anyway, when I was working, after reading your book, which I read, I'm like a bookworm, I love reading things that just resonate with me. I read it within like three, four days. And then after reading it, I just thought, wow, this guy is just like me. From where he started, his story, I could uh, you know, relate to it. So I thought, you know what? I can probably do this. I can probably not quit my job and go mad and start, start my private practice, but I thought, let me go down to one day. So I went to work and said, look, I need to go down part-time. Work, we're not having it at the time. They're like, listen, we're busy, we need you. So I remember making up an excuse saying, no, I need to help my mom, so I need that day off. So I went down to one day, um, and that's when it started. I remember treating a patient, and they gave me a fiver. Now, when you're working and getting paid a fiver, going back about seven years ago, was quite a lot of money. It wasn't even about the money anyway. It was just about the exchange of the service and getting the immediate cash there and then and not have to wait yeah. 30 days to get paid. So that just triggered something in me. I was like, wow, so I could treat somebody and get rewarded straight away. So obviously I was like, right, I need to go down to three days. So I went to work and I said, listen, I need to go down to three days. Work well, like, listen, we've let you off with one day. We can't give you three days. You're either going to work uh, four days part-time or you're gonna have to leave and i said listen there's something greater in me i'm gonna yeah, have to yeah. give this up so i went um and i remember going to my wife and my fiance at the time going listen <laughs> i've just quit this job good news i don't yeah. know oh, yeah, good news. <laughs> she was living she was like you're crazy how are we gonna pay the mortgage we just got on the property ladder then and bought our first house what are you playing at i was like listen i don't know how but i'm gonna figure it out i'll make it work so I remember going to um, local local printing agency and print out leaflets and drop them in and doing home visits and I approached three gyms. So I was in three gyms where I was traveling from one gym to the other and working like 70 hours a week and traveling everywhere. So after I was doing that, I thought, you know what, I'm getting tired of this. That's when Paul's kind of voice in my head was being drowned out after reading this accelerator. I was like, right, this guy is just, advised me to uh, <laughs> take this leap of faith. Now what? So I actually found myself being stuck and actually going, right, I've quit my job because I'm getting a bit of income, uh, but it's not sustainable. The wife was moaning at home. I wasn't seeing her a lot. So I was like, I need help. So that's when I went to uh, to Paul. And I think I then um, signed up for Cash Club, I think it was called at the time. 
yeah where i was speaking to lisa getting a bit of coaching she was trying to get an understanding of where i was and then that's when she said you know what now that you've done the accelerator you've grown from a one-month band and quit your job the next level is trying to get a team i was like you're gonna be kidding me i thought <laughs> i thought after doing this my life would be set yeah. so that's when i started learning about recruiting and i was like so i've got to get a front desk and I remember it thinking, this is strange. Why would I need a front desk, not a physio? How is a front desk going to yeah, help me, me to keep like, yeah, make me money? That's where the coaching sort of with you, Paul, came in to go, actually, with you treating patients, which was happening. I was treating patients. The phone was ringing, missing all the calls, so I couldn't scale up. That's why I was stuck. And the minute I then got a front desk, and then I had somebody taking all this crap and all this burden that I had, and I could just focus on treating uh, clients. So... Then having the front desk, I was like, right, I need my own location. Because at the time, I went from going to gym to gym and then renting in, in Manchester. And I thought, you know what? I need to get my own premises and I need to um, go somewhere where if anything happens, at least I can protect the business. That's when I sort of started looking for my own premises. Um, and then I managed to rent somewhere else for a year. And then once I had the front desk and I was just working by myself, I managed to raise quite a bit of money. The profits were looking good because I was getting all the money, but I was tired. And I think this was the biggest sort of game changer for me because I was working 80 hours a week and I was going, yeah, great. You know, I can bring on 30, 40 grand. But then I was thinking to myself, so what? It was eating away at the family time and my own personal life. So that's when, again, I reached out to the group. And at that time, I went into the... Um, 4% club, which was then surrounding myself with people that were going through the same from the UK, from Australia, literally global. And I started realizing that, you know what, there's the same problem that we're all having here, regardless of where you're based. So it was through that then I went from front desk and then to two physio, to marketing assistant, now getting on to getting an ops manager on board. Um, so yeah, it's just been a journey of growing, growing, growing. Uh, since started and like you always say Paul I can always do it and for me my biggest fear is not doing it in the right time or yeah. accelerate accelerating my success because I see a lot yeah. of clients who are 50 60 some of you know literally got mental health and breaking down because they just scrape their way through to success and I yeah. thought you know what there's one thing that I need and that sort of wisdom and understanding of how I can get there without yeah. being old so I yeah. think for me, with this kind of community, that's what it's about. It's learning the information faster um, so that I can apply it now and don't have to go through the heartaches and, you know, yeah. this trial and error business doesn't really work for me. I just want to know what I need to do and then execute and get the outcome and results. Yeah, I love it. Let me recap a couple of that. Um, I'm just writing some notes down here. The, um, the thing that, listening to you there, there's a few things jump out. The first one is, Everybody thinks their business is different. So somebody from America listening to this thinks that's really cool in England. Like it's different over there. The people are different. And the economy is different. They don't have, you know, Biden or Trump or whatever, right? It's like they always think that it's different over in England, right? And then somebody in England looks at America and thinks like it's cool over there. Like they don't have Boris. They don't have the NHS. They don't have this. They don't have the other. You know, everybody finds excuses for their area and their town and thinks that it is different. And yeah. like you said, one of the things that happens when you get part of a group like this is you get a global mindset and you start to think much bigger because you look at other people and you think well that's that's what i'm going through or you know they're in miami but that's the same problem as me or they're in um, yeah. sydney and it's exactly the same as me and look at that if that guy can do it you know then so can i and i think the second thing that that i'll point out just to kind of bring it home to people listening you just described a series of events that you didn't think were going to happen. You didn't expect them to happen. So it was like, I'll start my business. I'll start making some money and everything will be all right. Oh, shit. Now I need to hire. Well, I've hired. Oh, shit. Now I need to move the premises. Well, I've moved premises. Now I need to start building a team. And now I've built a team. I need to get these marketing people. And I need to get these. And I need to get my finances sorted out. And I need yeah. to, And it's just one constant walking into a wall after the other and that's the only way i can describe business is you just walk it even even when you're successful the 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 prize for being successful in business is another problem and that's like that's the thing that we've all signed up to which is why it's so difficult to do it on your own and for anybody that tries you just like you're almost shuddering thinking like how the hell could you pull this off 
you know and even if you did why would you want to like you say you're looking at people in their 50s and 60s i like i'm 40 now you know 41 and i look at that that kind of next bracket of 50 and 60 and think like whenever i get there i better not look like that i better not talk like that i, I better not be as stressed as that and i better not look back at the other end and go i've got some regrets i've got doubts i've got shit i should have spent more time with the kids i should have went on more vacations i should have got up early and went to the gym i should have had better coaches around me i should have had better network of people like there's not a chance i'm arriving at 50 with those types of things going on in my head and like i said we're obviously very very um kindred spirits so tell me a little bit about your successes what, what's the things you're most proud of recently sure so for me is to be able to go from one clinic to two what satellite clinic inside the gym and to be able to hire and keep the staff now and really understanding uh, people management and leadership really um, and understanding my scorecards and more about the role rather than the person obviously the yep. person has to fit into the team but i'm understanding more about the role is more important uh, than the people which again you guys have provided those materials to really understand right what does an ops manager role look like what should the physios be you know doing how we can actually train them in such a way that we're in private practice in a private yeah. clinic and how selling that is healthy, which again, from your book, is healthy yeah. to sell. That helped me to change that mindset, which most of us in the UK, we're kind of trained for the NHS where we're not told the back office or how to get clients and the importance of, you know, selling um, health and services. So, um, yeah, the biggest achievement has really been that to, to really um, understand as well, Paul, that the mindset that we carry, that like the business is a reflection of me, like you always yep. say. So how do I get this head trash? How do I get all this crap that's in my head that I've listened from parents, from people yep. that have tried to run business and failed, that are not going where I'm going and don't really understand and talking out of opinion. So I think that's been the biggest, really, I would say, to actually go, right, now that I've got this... Um, you know, now that I've got this clear and I know where I'm going, as you mentioned, uh, finance is another department and I'm going, right, CFO, what's this about? Yeah. I just thought business, you pay your staff, you know, you look at the bottom line, you get your profit, you do your taxes. <laughs> yeah. But actually I'm like, right, I've made this profit, but where's my money? Where is the money gone? So now it's actually looking at and doing cash flow forecasts and, you know, <laughs> it's like one thing after the other. So it's learning that and, and, you know, learning how numbers can turn into levers for people that you can actually go, right, yes, you're getting this X, you know, amount each month, but what does it mean? And then going and understanding how do you then execute that and get the team and not, you know, rub people the wrong way and scare them off and do it in a, in a loving way, essentially, but still get the results. Yeah. So um, that's the biggest achievement, I think, to understand that I can't do it on my own. I need a team. And yeah. now that I've got the team, how do I now start focusing on scaling and getting more profit? Because I'll be honest with yeah. you, the more stuff you're getting, the profit yeah. is going down. So I'm like, right, come on. Now I've got the stuff in. Let me try and uh, increase that as well. Yeah, it's best practices. I was talking to Kayla today as well about you. We were um, we're having a good sort of CFO review once a week. We do it, and um, they were telling me how even just a few simple changes to the way you're billing and um, collecting and um, uh, potentially how much money you're leaving on the table because of the practice yeah. of not billing at the right time and not sending invoices yeah. out appropriately. Do you know what I mean? Just things like that where you just think, like you'd have done that for five or ten years and just thought that was yeah. that's the way it was, right? And I actually yeah. laughed to Kayla and I was like. I'm laughing because that was me five, six years ago. Like we were doing exactly yeah. the same as what, what she <laughs> described you were doing. And then yeah. you think, God, now you watch over the next 20, two, two, uh, probably two to three months, the injection of cash that you're going to get. That's yeah. where your profit's gone. The profit's gone because you're, or the, that's where the cash is gone because you're paying somebody to do the service, but you're not getting the money in. Right. Yeah. And even if it is, it's like months later that you actually finally get the cash in. And all of a sudden there is a boost in, in cash because you're changing a simple process at the operating level of the company which again none of us have we, we didn't get taught this stuff at university and you've almost got to make the mistakes to be able to understand actually how powerful they are um when you go in and actually fix them and you know change the, the simple yeah. way of billing somebody yeah definitely paul and i think it's getting clarity and uh, getting that professional finance department where you actually get an understanding of where the business is so you can make some decisions because you can make some decisions, but with the right, with the wrong figures, yeah. then you're going to have a different sort of outcome. So yeah, it's really yeah. understanding that. Really. 
Right. Yep, yep, this absolutely. Is what we need to so tell me, obviously you're trying to, you know, your goal is very similar to mine. You're trying to build your business up, step out of the patient care, own the yeah. trains if you like, but not necessarily drive them every single day. Drive them if you want, yeah. you know, if you want a yeah. day on the trains, go back in and see some patients. What yeah. challenges have you run into as you look to step back from patient care? So for me, it's been um, a challenge of letting go. As you know, similar to yourself, you build this thing from scratch and you see it evolve into this, you know, uh, business that is essentially working without you but then there's still an element um of you that still wants to control so one of the things that i've kind of dealt with is actually letting go and actually trust myself to deal with the consequences if my staff don't achieve the goals or things that i want them to achieve yeah. and i think I, again going back to self-development and trusting myself it, it stems from that that's one of the things that i've had to do now that i'm starting to do that i'm still in the quick two days but what I'm finding is getting frustrated on how to get the team to come with me to the same level of thinking and like-mindedness. So it's good to get this information alone. And this is what I love about you, Paul, where you're trying to get the staff involved, trying to get everybody. Because it's very difficult and draining for me to go back and feed the staff and say, oh, this is what we're doing, this is where we're going. Yeah. So that's been, the, that's been the challenge, especially with things changing, things getting a bit tougher here. It's how can I... I deal with my staff to look at things differently, to look at, you know, the, the, the opportunity that experts don't suffer in recession, regardless of what's happening. You know, the physio treatment and the physio requirements has got nothing to do with the gas and electric and things going up. People yeah. are still going to be in pain. So yeah. how can I get my staff to really understand that and, you know, tell people that in a way that they're not almost putting the brakes on and judging people based on their perception. So that's been the hardest thing because it's reflected in the numbers when you go in and then you say a person, well, why didn't you ask for this or create a solid environment? You actually find that it, when you start looking at deeper level, it's their perception on the world and what they're dealing with, which is then uh, clients can sense that. So that's been the biggest sort of uh, challenge to, to get my team to come with me to that high level. Thing. Or again, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one, and I think it's a challenge that a lot of people listening to this are gonna are gonna have. That the press are wonderful at startling people and scaring us and spooking us into like everybody's suffering and everybody's struggling and everybody is bollocks. Like, there's no such thing as everybody, right? That's the first thing I say to my staff, and I think it's a good opportunity. And for everybody listening, I I genuinely think it's a good opportunity for you to educate your staff on how the world actually works, not on the way the media want us to think that it works if you if you honestly think that every one of your patients is going to be affected really badly this this winter you're living in cuckoo land like you're living in you've been reading too many newspapers and watching facebook don't get me wrong not 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 nobody wants this nobody wants a, a gas rise nobody wants a, a you know the the fuel to go up nobody wants their interest rates to go up right but for a lot of patients that you'll come across the majority of people who look for our type of service our type of care, our type of professionalism. They do that because they think differently about themselves. They think better about themselves and they want better for themselves. They're not going to cut off physiotherapy for the sake of a few hundred dollars missing at the end of this month because, and again, don't don't shoot me down. There is a lot of people that can't afford physiotherapy, but the majority of the people who are paying for private physiotherapy will not suffer in a way that they can't come for physio. They'll be irritated by $200 extra on their mortgage, $150 extra on their gas. Absolutely, yes, will they be pissed? Nobody would choose that, but the majority of your patients will still have enough left over to be able to come for physio. We were never luxury purchases. We, we've, I've said this from day one. You've read my Accelerator book. We are a grudge purchase. We were never, ever at the top of the list anyway, right? The things that will go will be Netflix, Amazon's, unnecessary payments to shitty things that just whatever there'll be two one takeaway meal instead of two there'll be one night out instead of two there'll be like these are the things that people will do they'll just tighten their belts but when it comes to physio they'll definitely we, we're not in that category where people will just call us and that's the bit you've got to get across to your staff that, that it is not possible for everybody to be suffering not everybody doesn't want to pay the extra but for some people, they'll just roll their eyes and go, shit, that's not ideal. Oh, okay, don't really like it. I'll suck it up. We'll get on with it for a year. And you know what? They keep talking about this where everyone's going to be affected by interest rate rises. 
I spoke to a few of my friends at the weekend. We had a discussion about this. At least four out of five of them said I'd locked in six months ago and I'm good for another three years. Some of them said I locked in my energy. I'm good for two more years. So actually you think about it, again, everybody isn't going to be affected because some people have like already capped their prices. They've already locked in their mortgage. They don't need to drive to work because they're working from home these days. The media will just startle the life out of everybody. My tip to anybody listening in a leadership position, managing people, don't let that creep into your office. You be a policeman, a guardian of 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 the truth, if you like, of the the real. This is what life is. Like this is the way it is, not the way that the press want you to believe it. That yes, compassion for the one or two out of ten who will be affected by this, but your customers are not your typical just walking in and buying cheap stuff, right? They're, they're just not. They're already happy to pay for something that their class is a. Um, an essential item in their life, a grudged essential item, but most definitely by the time they're calling us in the private world, they've already decided that they want better for themselves and nine out of 10 of them are not going to be affected by any price rises in the next six to 12 months. Use it as a great opportunity to educate your staff. And by the way, anybody who listens who doesn't agree with what I've just said, why do you want to be right? What the hell do you want to be right for? What other alternative have you got other than to go in your office and say, this is the way it is. We're going to get through this. Let's hold our ground. Let's step up our service. Let's give it even better service, more compassion, more empathy for our patients, and just be better at what we do. Any other option, you might as well close your shop right now. So what else? Let's stay on the banner of managing people. Challenges. Yeah. Oh, so we, what, have you, what have you what have you found what have you learned you're a pt so, like me we never have to manage these people these, these irrational me included in it you know beasts yeah. of human beings what have you learned so i've learned that for my physios selling and understanding uh, the mechanics of it and the importance of it is something that doesn't come natural so again it's showing them that it's okay to create you don't have to sell you can create a buying environment all you're doing is offering and saying look we can offer the opportunity for you to have this to have that therefore this will benefit you in terms of achieving your goals so i think now we're getting to a point where my staff is understanding that they're not selling and shoving things but in fact they're actually not doing the patient justice if they're not offering them for example, insoles or orthotics that we sell. Yeah. So if they're not offering that, the patient can go and get it, you know, from a podiatrist or someone down the road. And we're actually going, well, why didn't we offer that and create that environment? So it's getting the balance of being clinical. Uh, we, had a, we had like a CPD day where we were saying, what makes the greatest, you know, therapist? Um, is it the clinical side of things or is it more the rapport and the ability to connect with people? So one of the things that came out is like, oh yeah, yes, you gotta be a good, you know, PT clinical yourself. But one of the issues that my physios uh, were doing and they're working towards not doing now is actually seeing a patient in front of them. These are one of my wins that I've been working through as a friend. So imagine with Starbucks, you don't have this white coat syndrome where you've got a clipboard and you're okay. trying to box them in into this kind of environment because what you're then doing to that patient subconsciously is telling them that I'm just here to fix your knee or your shoulder. You're not really saying, look, I want to get to know you and see what your problem is. And then once we've solved this, we can see if there's anything else health-wise that you need, um, you know, yeah. that we can serve you with. So it's shifting from treating the pain and shifting into a holistic approach of health. So when we switch it that way, it's making the client lead on how far they want to go. Now, if they feel like they've had 30 sessions, 50 sessions and managing and able to go skiing and boxing, then they can say, right, I think I'm able to do this, I'm able to do that. But then at the end of that, it's actually going, well, we want to keep you there. So how else can we ensure that we're doing that? So that's where we're starting to introduce things like gym, one-to-one -one personal training, because we don't all go and work out once in a lifetime. It's an ongoing thing. So I'm training my staff to go, how do you gradually build that into the system of people to say, look, it's not just about, you know, 12 sessions, 20 sessions, just like I was not about eating vegetables once a week. Yeah. How do you get into that habit and that lifestyle? So I think that's what we are we're kind of achieving. Yeah. It's funny. I, the first thing I wrote down there when you said selling does not come natural, 
um, I would argue it does. And, um, you know, you, you've been around when I've told you my stories of the kids and Tobias selling me on various different things, right? You've got kids and it's coming, it's coming to you in the next year or two when they start to talk and ask for things and they're going to sell you on everything, right? And every single person listening to this who's got kids knows that they get sold. They get sold on stories. They get sold on toys. They get sold on however that that if that five-year-old wants that toy they'll figure out a way to sell it to you they want the bedtime story they'll figure out a way to sell it they'll just ask a question that's beautiful i know it's late daddy and i know we won't get time for a story tonight will we well, do you want one son well if you want to read me one son let, like if you want to read me one dad then then yeah i'll, I'll have one okay so I'll, I'll read you a story mom dad said we can have a story tonight right and then natalie will go to me i've just told them the kind of a story Really? And I'm like, well, he just used that to tell me that they can't have a story. And I said, well, yeah, you can, right? And these kids are five and eight. So for any of us to sit here and suggest that we don't sell naturally is bollocks, right? It's complete crap. Like, we're hardwired to sell. I believe firmly and squarely that it's hardwired into our DNA because it's the only way to survive. If we can't sell, we can't, we can't make money. We can't eat. Track it, track it hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years they've been selling, whether it's the exchange of like rice or like land or whatever it will be, right? Like however yeah. somebody had to survive, like, you know, back to the, the however many hundreds of years ago, right? The, the, the politicians yeah. were selling each other on not going to war or whatever, right? Or going to war, like however you, you know, you want to dress it up. We've been selling since the year dot. And really we had to in order to survive, like, you know, even the, the bloody gladiator or the selling animals and people, like, again, it's wrong. Hor like, it's horrendous. Like, do you know what I mean? You, you track it all the way back to that. Like, from from day, from day dot, from day dot, a human being is hardwired to sell to survive, right? Like, that's, that's what we've all had in us. We've all been, whatever reason, whoever it is, has given us the ability to sell something to survive. And really what's happening is ultimately we're getting it knocked out of us from a very early age. And that's the bit we have to kind of just tap people back into that actually it's all right to sell. Uh, that was the title of the book, to sell is healthy, right? To sell is healthy. It's fine. Like if we don't sell healthcare, people don't get healthy. That's the kind of play on words in the book that we have to sell it in order to get people healthy. And I think if you just reconnect people in your team, in your office to the fact that actually you've been doing it, we're, we're designed to do it, we're born to do it. And other than this emotional blackmail that people put us under and the guilt and the political craziness that we live through selling is actually a really cool thing to have it's certainly if you push me on it and said my kid can have a, a first class degree in selling or a first class degree in fucking economic or, or, or history or politics or some crap that people are going to school to do all day every day if you think that you're going to have a better life with that type of thing and the ability not to sell it i'd, I'd candidly i disagree so um again I, Go on. Yeah. I was going to say on that note of selling, I do have my book. Well, let's, let's talk about it. Again, <laughs> Which, just, if just, anybody just watching, no, first one, yes, still want to get it. Yeah. Talking of selling, anybody watching, you can get a copy on Amazon. Sorry, Paul, go on, carry on. <laughs> Give us a name. Again, for everybody listening, let's support. I, I love the fact that, that there's, you know, there's people listening to this podcast. Let's support the community. And ultimately, I think it's very inspiring what you've done. And if you're listening to this and you, you know, you, you're hearing this, this brought a book. Why don't you just buy it out of appreciation for another PT, yeah. just like you, who's done something wonderful, and maybe be inspired yourself to write your own book. Give us the title of the book, Nash. So it's called "Discover the Secrets to Aging Well and Staying Active." So this book is just basically a road tip for my patients um, to create that kind of expert authority side of things, and for me, really. And for, for sort of my family and my little girl. So it's one of them books where I share about the secrets of staying active. As we just mentioned before, things are not just one off, it's a lifestyle of things. So in here, I talk about how you know, healthy eating and regularly exercising, the benefits of endorphins and things like that can help you to kind of stay, uh, stay active. And ultimately, to live an active, an active life because you know, our health is our wealth. And without it, we're, we're going to struggle to do a lot of things. So yeah, um, that's that's the book. Good for you. Well done. Um, go on. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that's another thing I managed to do as well. It's one of my achievements to write a book in the midst of building a team, and you know, a lot of people say they don't have time, but I think if you're committed and actually go right, I'm going to dedicate two hours to write, you know, this amount, then yeah, you can get it done. Biggest lesson you've learned so far in business. 
Um, it's not easy, and I think people. So probably, let me put it. Let me put it into context for people listening. So, we're at how many staff? Six staff. Uh, five. So we're at five staff. So yeah. for everybody listening to find themselves in it, we're at five staff. How many visits a week on average in your in your clinic? Fifty-five. Fifty-five visits uh, a week for each physio. Yeah, for each, for each physio. physio. So it's about, yeah, so about two hundred visits. So about two hundred visits a week coming through the business. We're at five staff. Nash is beginning to step out of patient care. What's the best and biggest lesson that you like to share to getting to this point? I think it's to really decide as a business owner or anybody watching to go, what do you want? Because ultimately, it's for me personally, it's getting the balance of keeping my family life um, happy and keeping the missus happy um, and my daughter. And yeah, can I just can time, I just explain the term missus because that that people are the, the wife right it's a the, the missus is a is is slang in english for the wife <laughs> that's let's just clear that one up yeah 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 it's, it's getting that balance because look most people watching that are sort of in business and doing stuff they're probably getting the money but it's what are you exchanging and i think for me it's getting the balance of exchanging a healthy kind of you know hours that you can work while still being profitable and while still getting that balance at home I've seen a lot of successful people that have gone in and they've done very well at the cost of the, the relationship or at the cost of falling out with people. So I think for me, that's sort of the biggest lesson and the biggest kind of skill and the balance is yeah. the business growth to actually go, right, how can I move this needle, as you say, Paul, with minimal effort? Um, how can I get staff to do this for me? So yeah. ultimately, I can have more time to spend with the family and yeah. travel and do all those things. It's the... Um the title of my next book is extraordinary achievement and um it's because i believe the ultimate achievement in life is not just success so we're all conditioned by success money houses cars lifestyle visible things but there's many people who achieve success at the expense of um contentment relationships with family kids wife mrs misters um insert the blank parents and unless we've got that inner kind of contentment enjoyment balance if you like of what we're feeling about ourselves and enjoying life and feeling good about doing it as i always like to say what what was the point was there any real achievement surely the, yeah there was success but there was no real achievement and i think that's the real quest that we're on as business owners that uh, it's one thing to make a load of money but it's another thing to make it make a load of happy and um yeah. finding that balance and, and building that bridge between the two is i think it's our it's our life's work you almost owe it to yourself to to cross that bridge from success money buildings second premises third premises books all of those things um but there's something there's something else above all of that that if you crack it i think is um is really extraordinary in terms of achievement because not many people not many people figure it out not many people even realize that they can um last question biggest uh thing that you've learned whether it's from me or from the group the community the paul goff world if you like planet paul what's the best thing that we've been able to help you with i think it's to really understand uh, leadership um and actually understanding how I can impact and help other people essentially achieve their dreams while they help me achieve mine. So that's one of the skills that I'm just thinking, wow, looking back now, looking at the community, looking back what you're building, it's not about you, it's building staff, community, people who we can share, you know, some of the problems, some of the issues that we're having in order to get the outcome. So there's a lot of reliance of, oh, I need to do this, or I need to be there, or I need to be in the clinic. I need to be the yeah. best physio. But actually the biggest thing that I'm learning is physio is just a stepping stone to something that's greater. And in order to serve a wider audience, it's actually, as, as you say, it's creating that stickiness of you can get somebody coming in and they're coming in for physio services, but how then can you understand uh, me as a person to actually go, right, while they're here, how else can I serve them? Uh, how yeah. else can I make their life better? not just by giving them the hands of treatment but by reaching out to a wider audience and reaching out to uh to, you know to, to bigger and, and larger groups so i think for me that's what um that's one of the biggest things that i'm learning and self-development really invested in yourself because as i said at the start i think business is a reflection of where i'm at so i'm constantly yeah. looking to develop i'm constantly looking to make myself better and while i'm doing that it's taking it back and going right how can i use the same lessons 
to improve uh, my staff and uh, family as well. Because most of the stuff we talk about, they're life lessons. Yep. Yes, they're in the business context, but actually most of the, the things that you teach, you show us, you you know, you kind of lead on, are actually life lessons that can help us to be better human beings and, you know, get money at the end of it, use it to get money as an exchange, but ultimately be a happier person. Because, yep. yeah, take away the money, take away all the success. I think it's the process and the lessons that I'm learning through business that's helped me to sharpen me as a person, uh, which is priceless, really. Fantastic. The phrase I was taught many years ago, um, business development will never, ever exceed personal development. You'll never, ever, ever grow the business unless you grow the person. Business development cannot happen without personal development. And if the personal development stops, expect the business development to stop six to 12 months um, after you you know, you know press pause on that. And you see it so many times, people get addicted to coaching and they, they get good and they start moving on and their business grows. Then they go, oh, I've had enough now, I've got what I need, I'm, I'm good. And then six to 12 months later, they ring you back up and go, oh shit, like I've, I've took my foot off the gas a bit and you know the business hasn't gone as fast as I thought it would. I thought I could just set and forget. And you think, actually, no, that's not this, you know, what this game, um, what this game all, yeah. all about. There's an yeah. interesting thing you said there as well about um, the story we tell ourselves where we'll say, you know, I, I have to treat the patients. I have to answer the phone. I have to send the invoices. Um, we've just took on a new CFO client recently who revealed to the team that she was even still doing the bank reconciliations. Now, this business is nearly a million dollars, $950,000 in revenue. And the owner of the business is still three times a week doing the bank reconciliations. The story is I have to do it. I mean, that is just unbelievable. The stories I hear out of some of the service, you know, the, I said to you before, the yeah. best thing about providing services to my clients as I get to hear the truth and find out what they're really up to. And as a result, I can really, you know, really help people at the, the front end with conversations like this. And to yeah. think that a, a million dollar business owner is still reconciling the bank three times a week is just frightens me that, that that space isn't being used for creativity that thinking that time isn't being used and that business owner ends up getting stuck when they you know when they make decisions like that but i said this recently at the mastermind event there's a difference between pain and suffering right and pain business is painful sometimes like you, you gotta you kind of go through the hard yards right we got to do some stuff it's painful now and again the decisions we need to make the hiring the firing the pricing the customers you know you've got a, a big decision to make and the staff are having a say on it and your past staff are slagging you off and they've got whatsapp groups about you and like they'll be saying things on facebook and whatever right that's that's all by the by they take it all in the chain in your role but it only gets to the point of suffering if you put you into the story and i think that's what many people are doing listening to this podcast they're suffering and yeah, it'll be painful, but they're suffering because it's I am the one who needs to do the treatment. I am the one who needs to do the hiring. I am the one who needs to do the phone call. I I have to do everything around here, right? That's suffering. Pain is, this is a big decision, all right? Someone's got to make it, right? And I don't necessarily want to, but like, let's roll our sleeves and just get this thing done. It's, it's like, it's uncomfortable, it's a bit painful, but let's just roll the fucking thing out and get it done. But when it's like, oh, I have to do this again. Oh, I have to. Oh, I have to. Now I'm in suffering. And I honestly believe 99% of businesses are in suffering. And, um, you know, best there should be in a little bit of uh, pain every now and again that comes because of the growth of their businesses. And that's fine. Yeah. I, you know, I absolutely, I absolutely love that. So yeah, um, I was just going to say one more thing on that, Paul. One of the things that you do well, and it's not me to promote the event you know, that's coming up, it's events for me personally. You could if you wanted to, Nash. You, you could promote the event if you wanted to. Feel free. Come on, it's my show. We can do what we want. <laughs> so yeah, get to the show if you're not signed up. You're flying um, over from England. So, have, you, have you booked? Yeah, exactly. you if I get, yeah, if I'm coming, if I'm going from all Boston, the way from Bolton to Orlando. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, one of the things that I'd say is by getting yourself out of the environment. I mean, it's not even flying out. It's just getting yourself out of the office, the clinic room. Something happens in taking those steps out. And I think for me personally, having the opportunity to go and meet other people in the group and share ideas and, you know, travel abroad is one of the fantastic ways that you do. And I said this before, you don't necessarily need to do it uh, for your own self, but you're doing it for us to kind of say, hey, guys, this is the route. This is the way that I can get you out of that rat and think in that mindset and exposure which I believe you did the same to get where you are. So that's one of the things that I wanted to say, look, 
don't take it lightly. Don't, you know, make up an excuses to go, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. Uh, you know, I can't attend. It's probably really good because it helps you to rethink and come back fresh. Yeah. It's one of the reasons we haven't given a virtual option for this event. It, it's literally to force people to get on a flight, get their asses from wherever they are in the world, whether it's Australia, whether it's uh, Abu Dhabi. We've had um, a client from Abu Dhabi book, Canada, uh, Ireland. Obviously, we've got people flying over from England. Uh, when were you over last time? Was it November? Uh, no, March. it was March, wasn't it? No, you March. came over in March yeah, yeah. the big event. Yeah. yeah. What was that yeah. experience like? Just for the international oh, people listening, yeah. what was that experience like? <laughs> oh, it was excellent. I mean, it, it's it's the whole you know preparation of going, and I had the privilege to sit one of Paul staff sales guru for Barry, yeah. and uh, for me that's been sort of the highlight because to see what Paul has done and impart on people, talk about leadership. That was what, 12 hours, 10 hours, however long it was, of just pure understanding how when you get people or when you understand leadership, it's imparting the vision to the people. Because when I was speaking to Barry, he was speaking like you, you'd understand all these mechanics of how he does his role well and what it's like in the team and how you guys ultimately obsess over us as your clients and obsess on our needs and services and, you know, writing questions on the problems we have and ultimately solving them. So I think for me, um, talk about getting out of your environment before I even got to the event, I was really full. I was really That's like it. blessed and thought, wow, it's the people. this is so powerful. Yep. Yes, the people. It's like I said, you know, you, people are listening, thinking, well, I might come. I don't know what the content is. Is he going to talk about sales or leadership? It's like, whatever. Like, whatever I, I talk about, I promise you it will be on the button. It'll be exactly what people need. But that's not the reason to come. The reason to come is to bump into other people that'll that'll sound like you, look like you, your problems, your challenges, your issues, your issues with family, your issue with time, your issue with money, your issue with staff, like your issue with the economy, your town's everybody wants to pay rise and nobody wants to work in the office anymore all of this crap that we're all you know we're all going through it's worth getting on a flight um just for that but i i believe nash you make your own luck you didn't have to come that day and like you say you got more than your, your money's worth because you got to sit next to there just happened to be an empty seat next to one of my staff <laughs> on the same flight across the atlantic so i'd have done exactly the same as we would have been sat right next to him and filtering him for um and we got some extra food as well because Barry's is in. Yeah, can we get more food, please? There you yeah, go. There you go. He's salesman, so he'll, he'll have sold them on delivering it to the seat. <laughs> um, right, we're going to wrap it up. Um, here's what I want to say. I mentioned at the start of the of the conversation about this this place called Bolton. So for all of you listening who are from around the world who don't know Bolton, right? The English will, and the Scots and the Irish will probably get what I'm about to say. So if um, you're listening to this from anywhere in the world outside of Britain, there's a TV show that you've got to check out, right? If you want to know what Bolton is like, it is possibly my favorite TV show of all time. I've certainly never laughed as much in my entire life, and it sums up British humor like nothing. nothing. It's the one thing I miss about Britain is stuff like Phoenix Nights. So there's a TV show called Phoenix Nights, right? I'm sure you can get it on Amazon on where else you get your, you know, your streaming from these yeah. days. Check out Phoenix Nights. A guy called Peter Kerr is the genius behind it. And it's actually in um, the town of Bolton. And um, for a few months when I first met Nash, I used to say certain things that were off the TV show and I didn't realize Nash had never watched I the show. And then it became quite obvious that he hadn't watched the show because he wasn't laughing at certain things that I was saying. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But you've got to check out Phoenix Nights. Um, and if you do watch it, uh, everybody listening to this, if you watch Phoenix Nights, send me an email, uh, paul at paulgoff.com and just tell me how funny it was. And if I meet you at a bar, or meet you at a hotel, I meet you at one of our events, come and talk to me about Phoenix Nights and we'll just keep it our own little joke in and in amongst the podcast listeners. Download Phoenix Nights, give it a couple of watches and if you want to know what British humour is like, that's it um, to a T. Uh, and it, uh, to be fair, I mean, Paul is obviously a lot bigger than Hartlepool but similar kind of Northern working class, economically yeah. challenged, bad football team but, kind of town. Oh, yeah. I mean, it used to be a, it used to be a good football team. It used but, to uh, be good, yeah. Not anymore. Um, I remember when they were in the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had JJ Okocha back in the proper, days. Proper players yeah. back, um, you know, back in the day. Yeah, with the uh, Sam Allardyce's manager back then. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's been great. Thanks for uh, thanks for your time, Nash. Where can people find out no, more thanks. about you? What's uh, what's going on in, in your website? Yeah. Just various things. Sure. So you can check out our website, uh, www.t4physio.co.uk. Um, and then on Instagram, if you type in T4 Physio Clinic, you can follow us uh, as well. Same with the Facebook. 
Um, so yeah, keep uh, keep an eye out. Working on the second book uh, as well. So um, yeah, good for you. Honestly, everybody listening to this, uh, whether you're from England or wherever uh nash is just an absolute inspiration he's a superstar fantastic story great journey and i predict very very big things i predicted it two and a half three years ago when he first kicked off and um he hasn't let me down yet you are a star people listen to you watch you in the group nash so thank you for everything that you do we love you and the team love you and um it's honestly it's a it's a pleasure to see you um so you're doing so well and look so happy so well done congratulations thank you thank you all right right thanks listeners we do appreciate the podcast community um again we'd love to see you in orlando 6th 7th 8th and 9th uh we've got a big 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 event we'd love to see you there uh, wherever you are in the world come on over nash is flying over kevin vandy on the last podcast will be there um anybody who i introduce you to uh, who's doing well will be at this event coming up in october reach out if you've got questions about the vip package or the finance skills package paul at paulgoff.com or you can head over to www dot ppmlive22.com we'll put the links in the chat uh but if you're on the fence reach out ask a question um and we'll tell you exactly why you should be there but you will kick yourself if you miss this um it's going to be huge it's a fantastic hotel right in the heart of all of the attractions in orlando the weather will be fantastic it's also if i do dare say it it's one of the quietest times of year to visit Orlando, believe it or not. Between the 1st of September and about the 15th of October, it is the quietest time to visit Orlando. Um, the attractions are quiet. You can get on and off the rides in minutes. It's just a, it's a fantastic. It's basically the time between uh, the school holidays and obviously the uh, Halloween and all of the Christmas stuff. So it's a wonderful time to visit Orlando. Very cheap flights, uh, cheap hotels. Just come and bring your family, have some fun wherever you're flying from in the world. And just give me a chance to say hello to you, shake your hand. Uh, we'll have a beer at the bar and um, we'll say hello and uh, I'll get to know you a bit better. So. Thank you, Nash. You're a star. Thanks, Thanks for everybody Cheers. listening. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks again. Cheers, Nash. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.